Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. My name is Ping Wang. I'm a scientist from Creative BioLabs. And today, it's my great honor to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Bruno Paiva. Dr. Paiva is a research fellow of the Departments of Hematology and Immunology at the University of Navarra in Spain. He's also the director of the Flow Cytometry Call of the University of Navarra. Dr. Paiva's main area of expertise is the multidimensional flow cytometry analysis of hematological malignancies. His research focuses on immunogenomics to improve differential diagnosis, risk stratification, and monitoring of patients with monoclonal gamma persists and myeloid malignancies. He's an author or co-author of hundreds of publications in peer-reviewed journals and has been recognized with numerous awards. And today, he will be sharing with us his expert opinion on new ways of evaluating the tumor immune microenvironment from bench to bedside. Before Dr. Baiva starts, I would like to let all attendees know that attendees are automatically muted when joining the webinar. And to keep our webinar smooth and efficient, if you have any questions for Dr. Baiva, please submit your question into the QA box in the end of the presentation and Dr. Paiva will answer questions in the end. With that, I ask that you give all your full attention to Dr. Paiva and help me in welcoming him to the webinar. Dr. Paiva. Can you hear me? Can you please confirm that you can hear me and see my slides? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Well, as I was saying, thank you so much for the very kind invitation. It is for me a great pleasure to uh, participate in this webinar. And I would like to thank obviously Creative uh, uh, Biolabs for creating the space to, to, to for all of us to participate in this series of webinars. Uh, I will share some uh, opinions and my personal overview about new ways of evaluating the immune microenvironment. And certainly before I start, I should make a disclosure. And the disclosure is that being ourselves a clinical and research flow cytometry laboratory, most of our research, certainly most of our clinical efforts and research interest relies on hematological malignancies. Therefore, recognizing up front that for sure the interest of all participants is very heterogeneous in terms of uh, uh, disease settings, uh, biology, I will uh, focus mostly in hematological malignancies, particularly in multiple myeloma, Although at the very end of my presentation, I will also share some ideas and work we mm, developed recently uh, around COVID-19. Well, certainly the relationship between blood cancer and immunity is, I would say, interesting, long-standing, and to some extent not always friendly. At the end of the day, there are some immune cells that naturally modify their DNA, for example, B and T lymphocytes. We should recognize that some immune cells are already programmed to live for very long periods of time, such as, for example, plasma cells. And if we think on cancer as a simplistic overview of survival and proliferation, these cells are already half the way to become malignant. Uh, we also know that tumor leads to depletion of one or more immune cell types and anti-cancer treatment may induce further immune suppression. On the other hand, we also recognize that active immune surveillance may prevent disease progression from pre-malignant into malignant disease stages. And there is more and more evidence that immunotherapies can be effective, at least in some hematological malignancies. And therefore, it is not surprising to see that there is a growing number 
of available immunotherapies for the treatment of hematological diseases. These immunotherapies may either target non-malignant cells or malignant cells through passive or active immunotherapy. Certainly, if immunotherapies can have such a broad effect, then it, is, uh, it becomes clearly evident that we need new ways of evaluating or there are unmet laboratory needs to evaluate the immune microenvironment, also to evaluate immune surveillance after active immunotherapy, as well as to identify new targets and optimal modes of action for passive immunotherapy. Let me share with you an example that emerged from our laboratory, certainly in collaboration with another university Well, the B cell maturation antigen, BCMA, is selectively expressed and is, a, is essential for the survival of normal as well as tumor plasma cells. And a cancer such as myeloma is characterized by the expansion of clonal malignant plasma cells. Furthermore, BCMA is expressed across all disease stages, uh, including pre-malignant as well as malignant disease, and it is similarly expressed in patients with or without high-risk genetic abnormalities, broad expression in virtually all patients. Furthermore, when we look, for example, into protein expression, in multiple cell types in patients bone marrow, we would see that indeed BCMA expression is almost restricted to normal as well as myeloma plasma cells. Therefore, BCMA emerges as a very attractive target for immunotherapy against multiple myeloma. But if we compare in the same patients the density of BCMA in the surface of the myeloma cell when compared to other targets, such as, for example, CD38, for which there are already clinically validated and approved immunotherapies, such as monoclonal antibodies, then we realize that there is approximately a 75-fold difference between the number of C38 and BCMA molecules in the surface of myeloma cells. In other words, immunotherapies that rely, for example, in a naked antibody would not be most likely effective against BCMA because the density in the surface of the tumor cell is too low. However, other forms of immunotherapy, such as CAR-Ts, antibody drug conjugates, or bispecific antibodies that would be, in principle, agnostic of the density of the molecule in the surface of the tumor cell could be attractive. And therefore, we were delighted a few years ago to collaborate with NGMAP in the preclinical evaluation of a bispecific antibody that they have developed with this two per one format, uh, bivalent high affinity binding against PCMA and monovalent low affinity binding against CD3 to, min to minimize off-target uh, uh, side effects. This uh, bispecific antibody carries an heterodemic FC region with intact FCR binding to ensure long elimination of life. And this was the putative mechanism of action that was intended with this BCMA T cell by specific antibody. In other words, or as schematically as shown here, to redirect killing of tumor, of tumor targeted cells by release of seroitic enzyme, enzymes and cytokines from activated T cells whenever these would engage with the tumor cell mediated by the by specific antibody. Well, a brief summary of uh, 
would say two years of intensive research efforts show that uh, as I alluded before, BCMA is selectively expressed in all myeloma patients. Indeed, the bispecific antibody induces myeloma T cell binding in a drug in a dose dependent manner. That after binding, there was clear T cell activation again in a dose dependent manner. After T cell activation, there was myeloma cell killing that we observed in approximately 80% of patients' bone marrow aspirates, in other words, primary samples, ex vivo studies. We were also able to demonstrate in vivo activity in mice and in cyanomolgus monkeys. We were able to show that the molecule allowed for a convenient weekly dose administration. Well, after this preclinical development, the molecule was acquired by a larger pharmaceutical company, nowadays BMS Cell Gene, acquired a new name, CC93269, and approximately two years ago, the company started the first in human phase one clinical trial. Well, the first results were reported last year in the American Society of Hematology meeting, and I would say the results are outstanding. These are heavily pretreated relapsed refractory myeloma patients where a median time to first response was observed in approximately four weeks. 11 of the 13 responses are ongoing and many of these responses would have very high quality even with undetectable minimal residual disease. Well, Indeed, in my opinion, myeloma is an excellent cancer model to illustrate the importance of evaluating the microenvironment, since in principle, the microenvironment facilitates the continuous progression of myeloma cells, as well as it protects these myeloma cells from therapy. Well, let me share a few examples of how we are evaluating the microenvironment. I would say that nowadays with multidimensional and high sensitive flow cytometry, everything is possible. Even to isolate and characterize freshly isolated mesenchymal stem cells, which are very rare in primary bone marrow aspects. So without any in vitro culture, we directly isolated these MSCs, which are around 0.01 and sometimes even less in the bone marrow of patients in, with myeloma, as well as we also isolated these cells from young and elderly healthy donors as a control. And what we found is eventually a transcriptional, and then we performed RNA-seq, and what we found was a transcriptional modulation of the microenvironment during aging. The transcriptional profile of MSCs is already altered in elderly, healthy individuals. And some of these transcriptional programs that are altered with aging are very similar to what we find in patients with multiple myeloma. In other words, if we think on the concept of aging as, for example, the progressive accumulation of mutations in cells that will later can become malignant. We should also think on aging as a process in which other cells of the microenvironment are also being modified and are being modified to support the expansion of mutated, still normal cells. Another example that I would like to share is about myeloid-derived suppressor cells. I think that many in, in, in the field and hopefully some of uh, the participants uh, uh, recognizes and appreciates the importance of studying these cells. Um, these, cells these cells have been extensively studied in solid tumors as well as in some hematological malignancies. Well, what always surprised me is that, and mainly from my work as a cl uh, clinical flow cytometrist, is that if you look into the phenotype of particularly granulocytic MDSCs, 
in the literature of human MDSCs in the literature, you would see that the phenotype that is proposed, such as, for example, expression of CD45, 15, 11B in the absence of 14, DIM33, and the negative or DIM HLADR. Well, in a whole bone marrow or peripheral blood sample, this constellation of markers does not allow to identify a small subset of putative MDSCs. Rather, in this phenotype, you can appreciate the presence of a very large number of neutrophils and even other granulocytic cells such as eosinophils. And when we compare the percentage of these cells according to the phenotype available in the literature, again, these are not small numbers, these are high numbers, 30% or more. And in fact, we found no expansion of these cells in patients with myeloma when compared to elderly or age-matched healthy adults. And because of our inability to really identify a small subset of potential MDSCs, we decided to perform a comprehensive immunogenomic identification and characterization of these cells in patients with multiple myeloma. And after a series of experiments, we found that it was the more mature, instead of the more immature, it, were, it was the more mature neutrophils that could be identified based on simultaneous expression of C13, 11B and 16 that have the highest immune suppressive potential. And we demonstrated that because these particular cells have strong T inhibition of T cell proliferation and also significantly decrease T cell cytotoxicity in the presence of a bispecific, uh, uh, of a T cell bispecific antibody. And then we demonstrated that these cells have a clear immune suppressive potential because of transcriptional modulation in response to progressively higher levels of TGF beta in the tumor microenvironment. And in fact, this uh, transcriptional modulation was not being mediated by obviously genetic abnormalities in neutrophils, which are not a tumor cell of myeloma, but rather on epigenetic grounds because of these uh, chemokines. And therefore, we were also able to demonstrate that by using an hypomethylating agent, it was possible to revert the immune suppressive signature of these mature neutrophils. So in this study, we not only provide new markers for identification of these cells in the microenvironment of patients with myeloma, but also potentially new avenues to reduce their immune suppressive potential. I'll now talk about immune escape. Immune escape from premalignant into full-blown malignant myeloma. Similarly to other solid and immunological tumors, there is, in my opinion, a clear role for immune dysfunction in the pathogenesis of myeloma. There are many examples. I will share here some developed by other groups and later on some developed by our group. Patients with a premalignant condition that is very frequent in the elderly individuals, it's present in 3% or more of individuals aged over 60, so-called monoclonal gammopathy of unknown significance, MGAS. Well, these cases have already higher risk of infection when compared to age-matched healthy individuals. It has also been shown that polyclonal elevation of free light chains in the serum increases the risk of monoclonal gammopathies. There is some evidence that long-term immune activation by some lysolipids is behind some monoclonal gammopathies, such as, for example, the Gosher syndrome. Then there is also evidence that Again, even in pre-malignant conditions, there is an altered tumor immune microenvironment. And in fact, in patients with smoldering myeloma, which should be an intermediate stage between MGAS and active treatment requiring disease, it's myeloma in terms of tumor burden, but the patients are asymptomatic, and that's why it's called smoldering. Well, among these patients, those that lack antigen-specific immunity, 
some of those antigens being, for example, uh, uh, tumor-related antigens have higher risk of progression to active disease. Let me share some examples from our group. A few years ago, the Spanish myeloma group initiated a clinical trial exploring early intervention of patients with high-risk smoldering myeloma. In other words, among those patients with smoldering myeloma, those that have high risk of transformation to active disease. And these patients were treated with nine induction cycles of lenalidomide plus dexamethasone. And the group was able to show for the first time that the treatment induced clinical responses and most importantly, early treatment intervention was able to significantly delay time to progression into active myeloma. Now, what I would like to call your attention is that it was possible to show a remarkable clinical effect in terms of both time to progression as well as a significant improvement in overall survival. Yet, if we look into depth of response, only one out of four patients achieved complete remission, and all of these had minimal residual disease. In other words, it was possible to prevent the progression of myeloma without fully eradicating all tumor cells. And in parallel, we were able to show that treatment was inducing clear activation of T and NK cells throughout induction therapy. And when we compared the phenotypic profile of patients that remained asymptomatic versus those that progressed to symptomatic or active myeloma, we saw differences. And I would say most importantly, we found differences, such as, for example, the expression of uh, cytokine exp uh, expression of IL-2 in CD4 T cells, which is intrinsically related, or in other words, could be considered almost as a surrogate biomarker of the mechanism of action of some of the drugs that were being used, such as, for example, an immunomodulatory agent such as lenalidomide. Another example, it is possible for some patients that in, in whom there is persistent minimal residual disease after treatment to achieve long-term survival, five, even 10 years progression-free in many of these patients, even off therapy. And we were able to show that these patients achieving long-term survival despite persistent residual disease after treatment had a clear, a unique immune profile characterized by the expansion of effector cells as well as by a reduction of more immune suppressive cell types. We also we are also able to show that by using multidimensional flow cytometry, it was possible not only to evaluate in patients achieving complete remission the persistence of minimal residual disease, in other words, those very rare few tumor cells that persist in patients achieving complete remission that are not detectable by conventional tools, but that can be detected by sensitive immunophenotypic and or molecular methods. Well, we were able to show uh, uh, that by uh, capturing all information regarding MRD plus the immune composition of patients in the bone marrow, it was possible to identify a subset of patients that despite persistent MRD had a unique immune signature that was characterized by higher normal plasma cell recovery and a favorable immune profile related to a strong maturation in, from B cell precursors into more mature B cell stages together with reduced levels of nucleated red cells and as you can see in this Kaplan-Meier curve, these patients at the time to progression, that I would say was at least different when compared to all the other MRD positive patients. In other words, the concept of simultaneous MRD and immune monitoring. Now we'll come back to this, con to this topic later on. Well, in fact, uh, right now, the concept of immune surveillance in the setting of uh, 
evaluating treatment efficacy, and particularly nowadays in many metrological malignancies, MRD, minimal or measurable residual disease. I would say that, and hopefully also to, to some of you in the audience, there is clear interest in T cell recept receptor based cancer immune surveillance and eventually therapy. And I would say that again, from a more clinical flow cytometry point of view, I was always surprised and puzzled by the fact that despite so many research efforts, at least in, 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 in my particular field, it was still or it remained largely unknown the nature of the phenotype, the phenotypic profile of tumor in reactive T cells. And again, in my opinion, it is critical to understand, to know the phenotype of tumor reactive T cells for effective immune monitoring particularly in patients treated with immunotherapies that require recognition between TCR and tumor antigens presented in MHC class 1 molecules. Well, to address this unmet laboratory need in myeloma, we decided to perform simultaneous single-cell RNA and TCR sequencing of T-cells in the tumor microenvironment. We performed this in uh, 50,000 or more cells from nine myeloma patients. And we found that there was a mean of an average of 10 clonotypes per sample. In other words, clonal T cell expansions, T cell expansions sharing the same uh, sequence of TCR, T cell receptor. Here you can see the trajectory, the differentiation, uh, the, the maturation trajectory of all T cells from naive, central memory, effector, exhausted, senescent, etc. And if you look specific, specifically to clonotypes, you can see that clonotypes are, in to some extent, uh, they accumulate particularly in senescent and granzyme K uh, clusters. Then we were trying to look for specific markers that would allow for an indirect measurement of uh, the abundance of clonotypic T cells in patients' microenvironment. And we found, interestingly, that there was a mirror image between the presence of TCR clonotypes, which can be seen here, where each color corresponds to a specific clonotype, and the expression of CD27. In other words, those T cells expressing C27 are mostly here, whereas TCR clonotypes are mostly here. There is a mirror image. And it was interesting to see that when we performed immune monitoring of patients with myeloma, we found that those with a high C27 negative positive T cell ratio at significantly prolonged progression-free survival, irrespectively of the MRD status. In other words, by performing simultaneous single-cell RNA-TCR sequencing, we were able to potentially identify markers that could allow for an indirect measurement of putative clonotypic T cells that may or not recognize tumor antigens using, I would say, a much more cost-effective tool, such as flow cytometry, that is already being used for MRD assessment. Then, coming back to the last part of my presentation, evaluating the immune microenvironment, how to move this from bench to bedside. And in my opinion, this would require, I would say as expected, smart use of big immune monitoring data. Our vision, and certainly what we are currently doing in our laboratory, is to gather the more information as possible of patients' tumor and immune landscape, together with clinically careful and uh, uh, annotation of a patients' age, staging, cytogenetics, even prior treatment before the sample was collected, eventually the therapy that was delivered after that 
a sample collected so that based on simultaneous tumor and immune monitoring and all the parameters that can be obtained by simultaneous tumor and immune monitoring, we could ac actually ask a given software, well, what would be the patient's outcome based on all these factors if after this particular sample there is no further treatment or by contrast there is further treatment with one or two or three drugs for two, five years or indefinitely until disease progression. In my opinion, this is absolutely mandatory to bring immune monitoring from bench to bedside. Certainly, if we want to evaluate and extrapolate immune monitoring data, it needs to be massive, it needs to be objective, it needs to be unbiased, and it needs to be holistic, because you clearly don't know yet which immune parameter will be most importantly for a given tumor in a given disease setting treatment with a specific drug combination. And that is why I believe that, for example, in a field such as flow cytometry, we need more and more uh, semi-automated workspaces for the convolution and biomarker discovery of large immunophenotypic data sets. In our laboratory has been recently implicated in developing such kind of software. In, in sake of time, I will not focus on the software development per se, but rather I think that it would be more interesting, hopefully, it would be more interesting to the audience to share a recent example of how we used the software and not in myeloma, but in something that for sure is of interest to everyone because of the current status of the COVID-19 pandemic. Here in, in Pamplona, in the north part of Spain, during uh, um, the months of March, April and May, we uh, well received uh, peripheral blood samples from a very large number of COVID-19 patients, as you can see here, 513 for immunophenotyping to provide clinicians with lymphocyte counts in peripheral blood, as it was uh, already from the very beginning described as a potential prognostic marker. And what we decided was, well, in around May, beginning of June, well, let's use this kind of software tools to analyze a, a, from an holistic, objective and unbiased point of view, the immune status of COVID-19 patients compared to healthy donors, as well as to patients with other infection, infection rather than SARS-CoV-2. And based on a single combination of eight monoclonal antibodies, clearly a, comp a computational approach can see much more than our eyes can see. And as I was saying before, with a single eight color monoclonal antibody combination, it was possible to systematically identify up to 17 immune cell types in peripheral blood, some the innate, some adaptive immune cell types, such as the ones that you can see here in the slide. Well, first we started by looking at the distribution of these immune cell types according to age groups in healthy individuals, because we were expecting, and this is reasonable to expect, that the distribution of these cell types would not be stable across different age groups. And as you can see here, there are clear differences regarding the, the percentage or the absolute counts of neutrophils, specific NK or T cell subsets as healthy individuals become older. And based on this knowledge, we performed a comparison between patients infected with, with SARS-CoV-2 here in this color or other pathogens here in green, but, by, but performing an age-corrected comparison. In other words, each patient with COVID or non-COVID was compared to the corresponding age range in healthy adults. And basically, what we found is that most COVID-19 patients show an immune composition in peripheral blood that is consistent with an antiviral response, definitely similar 
to other pathogens. And as I would say, as it can be expected, uh, an expansion, for example, of inflammatory cells such as neutrophils, a reduction in multiple lymphocyte subsets that eventually are uh, migrating to, uh, to tissues or organs that are infected, a reduction in B cells that are maturing into uh, antibody secreting plasma cells. And I think that uh, 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 this data, in fact, could be seen as uh, opposite to many data that was being published back then with uh, emphasizing a lot of uh, immune perturbations in patients with COVID-19. But when we saw this, we, we thought, well, I think this is very much aligned to the fact that we are seeing a normal response, immune response to an infection. And this would be expected given the fact that 80% of patients have asymptomatic or a mild condition that even does not require treatment. Then what we saw was that virtually all immune cell types were associated with disease severity. Here we are comparing patients that have not been hospitalized versus those that have been hospitalized, those that require intensive care, and those that have died from COVID-19. And basically what we have found is that as the disease becomes more severe, there is a decrease in virtually all cell types with the expansion of increasing numbers of neutrophils as well as circulating plasma cells. And here, by looking into a, a, a multi-parameter overview of, of COVID-19 based on the flow cytometry immunophenotyping, we found that there was a 15% of patients that showed this uh, specific immune signature characterized by the expansion of neutrophils and circulating plasma cells, counterbalanced by reduction of all the other immune cell types. And these 15 and only 15% of patients were significantly associated with high rates of uh, uh, fatal COVID-19 as well as specific pre-existing con medical conditions such as cancer, particularly hematological cancer. And in fact, in our series of COVID-19 patients, we found that those with a blood cancer had a higher frequency of intensive care, as well as higher frequency of fatal COVID-19. And nowadays, this has been reproduced by many different groups that focus on blood cancer. And we found, and were able to demonstrate that patients with blood cancer, when compared to all the other COVID-19 patients, which are here illustrated in these gray uh, box plots, well, they have clearly more immune deregulation. And this is important. We were able to show that this immune deregulation can be found both in patients with malignant disease, such as, for example, myelodysplastic syndromes, acute myeloid leukemia, some type of lymphoma, but also in patients with premalignant conditions, as I said before, MGUS, as well as, for example, monoclonal B cell lymphocytosis. And this is important because these premalignant conditions are quite frequent, frequent in the elderly, in the elderly population. Well, we then identified what were the most relevant cutoffs, both in terms of percentage as well as absolute counts of all the, the 17 immune cell types that, were, that we were identifying by flow cytometry and found in multivariable analysis with age as, a, as well as other comorbidities that two immune cell parameters emerged with independent prognostic value for overall survival. In addition to age, these were non-classical monocytes and B cells. And I believe that back then, and the, the, the study was already performed before summer and sent to, to, a, to a journal before summer. Uh, we believe that this was one of the first studies really emphasizing the importance of B cell numbers in peripheral blood, which is, in my opinion, no surprise given the fact that B cells are the preceding stage of plasma cells, which are the ones responsible for producing antibodies against the virus. Well, most importantly, we showed that 
by performing, by developing an immune score where less than 0.7% of non-classical monocytes and less than 1% B cells were risk factors. This was possible to stratify patients, uh, 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 the risk of, uh, 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 for overall survival of patients older than 70 and those with a high risk immunotype had a median overall survival of only 15 days. But I would say more importantly, this immunoscore was also clearly significant in those patients younger than 70 in whom theoretically one should not expect fatal COVID-19. Then by performing immune monitoring during patients' follow-up, we found div divergent immune trajectories in patients with fatal outcome. And importantly, these imply not only non-classical monocytes and B cells for which you can see clearly a different traje trajectory in patients dying from COVID-19 when compared to all the other patients that did not die from the disease, but during follow-up, other immune cell types become particularly relevant, such as, for example, immunoregulatory and cytotoxic NK cells together, together with specific T cell subsets. So these kind of new tools to evaluate immune composition here in patients with COVID-19 uh, allow it to really provide new tools for recertification. And I must say that nowadays, as we are in the peak, perhaps, or hopefully, of the second wave of COVID-19 in Spain, these tools are being used every day in dozens and dozens of patient samples that we are receiving for immunophenotyping. Well, as always, this can only be accomplished by very large teams working in clear collaboration. And this will be my final slide and message. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Bruno Paiva, for the great presentation. It's very informative and um, insightful. Uh, so next, we will take questions of our attendees. Um, all right, so um, the first question is, um, do you think that for uh, by specific activity, there's a minimal number of CD3 positive cells. Are those T cells required in the tumor microenvironment or are they recruited by the by specific from circulating T cell? Well, thank you, this is a, a very good question. I would say yes and no, and I'll try to clarify. I would say that yes, in such a way that for example, in a patient that is relapsing from a given condition, and uh, for example, previous treatment has clearly induced immune suppression and very low levels of, for example, T cells. In such a patient, a T cell engager might not be tremendously effective. However, in patients that are not clearly immune suppressive, we have failed or we were unable to find a relationship between T cell numbers and preclinical or clinical activity. And I would say that uh, one of the reasons by which perhaps we have not found this relationship is because uh, T cells can be uh, uh, recruited from the circulation into the tumor immune microenvironment. The only signal that thus far we have found on preclinical grounds regarding a potential relationship between efficacy and T cell composition was not related to numbers per se, but rather if T cells as a whole showeth before treatment an exhaustive phenotype, for example, with a strong expression of a checkpoint inhibitor such as PD1. Thank you. Um, so the next question is um, in immunotherapy, uh, different patients, you know, would have different drug sensitivities to the same immunotherapy. And one of the reasons may be the difference in biomarker. So do you think phenotypic drug discovery is a better way to uh, obtain drugs with, for better clinical response? 
I do hope so. It, it is certainly something that we are tasked to do, but as I said at the beginning, this would be a very challenging research effort. I do foresee a future in which there are so many different therapeutic alternatives that are not effective in all patients. And the truth is, are also very expensive and some may induce severe toxicity that there is clear need for precision immunotherapy. And I do believe that because of the mode of action of many immunotherapies, tools for precision immunotherapy would rely on careful evaluation of tumor and immune cells in the microenvironment. However, if we recognize that there is great heterogeneity, for example, regarding tumor genomics, I would say that from an immune point of view, there is even greater heterogeneity because it may be related to the tumor per se, but also to the patient age, previous treatment, previous medical history, etc., etc., etc. So the only way I foresee to really develop tools for precision immunotherapy from an immunological uh, characterization point of view is to really develop big immune data so that you can pinpoint a new patient into a constellation of patients that have been characterized the same way, or at least you have information on the same immune parameters to make an estimation of what would be the response or resistance to that particular immunotherapy. So it would be still a long way to achieve these aims. Right. Thank you so much. And the next question uh, is, so there are more than uh, hundreds of types of uh, bispecific antibodies reported, and different antigen binding domains can be arbitrarily combined into uh, many different constructs. So what do you think are the major considerations during the design of the bispecific antibodies? What do you think are the critical uh, parameters we should consider? Well, myself not being an expert in, in the design and development of bispecific antibodies, I can only share some, uh, some uh, ideas uh, based on our preclinical and clinical uh, uh, work. Um, in, in my opinion, the development a few years ago of a bispecific antibody with an FC region was from a, from a clinical point of view and a quality of life also point of view very important because it allowed to uh, a, a new and a preferable way of administration rather than for example infusion and nowadays it is possible to administrate some of these bispecific antibodies uh, subcutaneously then uh, again and, and, and I, would, I would say that uh, uh, by specific antibodies that do prioritize the affinity of binding against uh, uh, the tumor antigen rather than affected cells is also, I would say, uh, uh, an interesting approach to minimize toxicity. And um, I mean, beyond this, uh, I, I have no, no further insight. I think that uh, for sure you and many of, of uh, uh, I'm sure many of th th those that are listening uh, uh, are much more experienced, but I'm seeing with great interest how, uh, let's say, first generation of bispecific antibodies are evolving into newer generations, such as, for example, tri-specific antibodies that, as far as I know, are trying to mimic some of the concepts of CAR T cells, but into a blood form that can be delivered off the shelf immediately to a patient. And this is, in my opinion, very attractive. Furthermore, it does not require on the persistence of those engineered T cells. Rather, you can continuously administer the drug. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have um, three more questions. Uh, so um, one of them is, would you prefer a high or low or medium affinity CD3 binding to obtain a better killing with a bispecific? 
And what about uh, bivalent CD3 binding? It seems to be um, with negative effect in compared to a monovalent CD3 engaging. Well, like I said, not, not being an expert, I mean, we, we, were, we, had, we have a positive experience with the monovalent C3 binding, but uh, I mean, I, I, I'm not one to, to, to uh, give insight of whether or not a bivalent C3 binding would increase efficacy. But uh, uh, like I said, being, for example, CRS uh, uh, an issue with this kind of therapies, I would always try to balance as much as possible efficacy with toxicity. Always also considering that uh, while at the beginning, in the initial stages of clinical development of these compounds, these are evaluated as a monotherapy in relapsed refractory patients. If results are positive and uh, these drugs continue on their clinical development, they will be added into a backbone of uh, uh, drugs that are already effective for that tumor. And therefore, in a scenario of drug combination, again, I would perhaps prioritize safety over efficacy, not minimizing effic efficacy, but you need to be able to deliver the drug. Mm -hmm. And the next question is from the same person. Um, so do you think that naive T-cells are involved in the immune response to COVID-19 based on your data, or is more a reaction from mature T-cell already presenting T-cell receptors able to interact with COVID-19 epitope? Well, I would say in principle that both could be important players. Our study was not powered to really answer this question because you need uh, to sequence the TCR in different, uh, in different cell types. But uh, there is, uh, uh, again, myself not being an expert in infectious diseases, I think there is emerging data suggested, suggesting that uh, uh, immunological memory against other pathogens may increase the chances of a good immune response to COVID-19. What I believe our data illustrated, and our data was very descriptive, the only power of our data was back then, uh, I insist, several months ago to really provide data in a very large series of patients uh, was really to understand what can go wrong. And in my opinion, what our data suggested is that for individuals in which by different reasons, for example, a blood cancer, there is clearly compromised B cell compartment. Well, if because of highly compromised B cell compartment, you are not able to generate in a short duration of time antibodies and also in clear crosstalk with T cells and eventually dendritic cells in germinal center reactions to develop high affinity antibodies as well as high affinity T cells. Well, the lack of this uh, adaptive immune response in a reasonable amount of time would prolong for very, very long time, an innate response with consequent uh, progressively higher inflammation and migration of uh, cell types, such as, for example, non classical monocytes into the tissues infected. And I think this is, uh, this is uh, I would say, the main conclusion of, of our study. Back then, we felt that it was important because uh, at least the data that were being exposed is that many, many research groups were emphasizing on antigen presenting cells, on T cells, but I think that uh, uh, little attention was being paid to quantifying B cell and plasma cell numbers in peripheral blood. We all know the importance of detecting uh, antibodies in serum against the virus, but uh, I think that uh, what our data shows is that from an immunophenotypic point of view, quantifying uh, different immune cell types in peripheral blood of these patients, perhaps the most relevant cell type to quantify is the B cell compartment. Mm -hmm. And our last question um, is, so for um, CAR-T and bispecific 
therapists. We know they uh, have their own advantages and disadvantages. And uh, it has been reported that a combination of bat specific antibodies and uh, uh, engineered T cells um, can be used to get rid of their disadvantages. So what is your opinion on the prospect of this approach? Well, in the, that it's interesting in principle. I must say that, uh, for example, in a country such as Spain, beyond the potential synergistic effect, you also need to think on uh, patient and uh, economical toxicity. And uh, a combined uh, treatment with a CAR T and a bispecific would be very, very expensive. And I don't know if it's feasible for, uh, I mean, at least in a country such as Spain. And then one would need to understand if both approaches could be delivered in combination or sequentially, because in combination, simultaneously, again, toxicity such as CRS could be an issue. And if sequentially, one would need to be careful about potential mechanisms of resistance. If, for example, resistance is mediated through loss at the target, such as it has been shown, for example, in some patients with B cell precursor acute lymphoblastic leukemia, then this would be an issue for a drug such as, for example, binatumumab. Whereas by contrast, it appears that in myeloma, resistance to BCMA CAR T cells is not being mediated, at least in the vast majority of patients, through loss of BCMA, rather to low persistence of BCMA CAR T cells. Thereby, further treatment after the CAR T with a BCMA by a specific antibody would in principle, or could in principle, be effective. Thank you so much, Dr. Paiva, um, for bringing up so many uh, insightful uh, expert opinions on the tumor immunotherapy. And uh, I would also like to thank all the attendees being here today uh, with uh, Dr. Paiva. And I hope everyone has a fruit, uh, fruitful um, time uh, today uh, with this webinar. So um, thank you so much for all of your uh, presence and uh, we hope to uh, see you in our next webinar. Thank you so much, Paiva. Thank you, have a good day and I wish uh, all of you and your families to continue in good health. Same to you. Bye -bye. Have a good day, thank you so much.